Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this latest live global Inmar webinar. My name is Mark Challoner from Inmar, and I'll be moderating today. Uh, we've had a, I always say this, we have a big response. We do get a big response to all our webinars, but particularly today, uh, we have had uh, about 400 people registered for this, uh, this webinar from, uh, unbelievably, 60 countries around the world. Uh, we seem to have every four corners uh, covered. I'm just looking down the list. We have people from Australia to Malawi, Belgium to Poland, Canada to Italy, Brazil to Singapore, Colombia to Lithuania, Nigeria, USA, Pakistan, Hungary, South Africa, the UK, Mexico, Switzerland, Albania, El Salvador, Sri Lanka, Turkey, and everywhere in between, it seems. So such is the interest in today's uh, session. Uh, everywhere is, everybody is welcome today. I hope you enjoy it. I'm sure you're going to. It's a really, really good and um, very interesting subject we're gonna cover. So just a couple of house notes before we start. The presentation is being recorded. Uh, a link to that presentation and a link to the slides that you'll see today will be sent to you over the next 24 hours just depending how long Zoom takes to upload to the system. And speaking of Zoom, and I know post pandemic, we're all experts at Zoom now, but just to say, if you have a Mac or a PC, it, this will appear in different parts of your screen, but you will have a Q&A button. If you have a chat button, ignore it, just go to the Q&A, and at any time during the presentation, please pop your question in there, and I will try and relate as many as I can, many questions as I can to our speakers before uh, we finish today. So don't uh, hesitate, just put it in at any time. The, the maximum we'll have today is an hour, so that you know that's your commitment to us. I know we all have busy diaries. So on to today itself. And you can see on the screen what the subject matter is. Um, and uh, what we, who we have, we have Paul Roberts, who is the head of payments and billing for Aptitude Software. And we have Erica Katsambis, who's the vice president of sales and partnerships and solutions for Miller Technologies. Both are based here in the UK. So in essence, just to set the scene, how can we supercharge retention rates and protect reader revenues in times of economic uncertainty? The global economic downturn is posing a threat to non-essential subscriptions, as we all know, limited household budgets, etc. And Paul and Erica will today discuss how, at a time of significant disruption, it's important for media businesses to leverage the latest technology to maximize recurring revenues from existing subscribers. And all through optimized billing processes, retention flows, and win back opportunities across multiple channels. So today we'll explore a range of tactics to reduce both the really important factors of involuntary and voluntary churn. We'll discuss that in more detail as we go across various channels, including directly via self-care portals and indirectly through banking gaps. So uh, just a little <clears> bit of word about Minna before we start to introduce themselves there fully in a second, but uh, they're a technology partner to leading financial institutions and innovative fintechs and subscription businesses providing subscription management functionality to over 20, million, uh, 20 plus million banking customers alone in the UK, United States and Europe. It's a massive company. So uh, we're really looking forward to what they have to say to us. And first, we're going to, to go to Paul, I believe, who's about 200 miles up the motorway from me here in London and in a place called Wigan in the north of, uh, of England, very close to my birthplace in Liverpool. Hello, Paul. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Mark. Nice good. to meet you. It's, it's nice to meet you. And it's really good to have you on. Um, yeah. Listen, this, we're really looking forward to this. Um, it's really, really good. And um, it's a really great start topic. It's very much on vogue as well for our audience, for the media audience today. So um, we're looking forward to what we have to say. So the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, everyone. Thanks for uh, taking the time out of your busy day, I'm sure, to, to attend this. And I hope you enjoy the session. So we'll just get started, really, on the um, overview of, of what we're really looking at here from a the reasons why this is probably so important to all of you that have joined today in the high numbers. Um, so to give you an overview, really, the, the reasons that are driving this are, are, are mainly around the, the current in it, the climate, but also those things that we see on a regular annual basis. So from an economic perspective, obviously, as 
as um, uh, kind of publishers within this space, you're very much aware of the economic uncertainty that's going across the, the globe, impacting different countries and different regions in different ways. You know, whether that is heading towards a recession, whether it's just the uncertainty itself, or whether you're kind of already within that stage, certainly something as a business that's impacting you is probably as well as a consumer. Um, we've also got that seasonality in terms of the Christmas effect, you know, people wanting to look at um, reassessing their subscriptions um, and their outcomings and such as well, which is which is adding to that. And that's always something that as a, a publisher you to be aware of. And again, also the, the, the kind of focus really from a, a move as a, a, an overall business model to focusing more on subscriptions and the revenue that can, that can bring you. But what we're also trying to talk to you today about is around areas of, of a way of improving that. So also looking at other business model revenue opportunities um, to, to reduce some of those economic pressures and the tools and techniques that we can to help to, to improve those as well. So as I say, the big thing really um, is around that subscriber reassessment that's happening in the market, you know, the, whether that be Christmas, whether that because of the, the COVID peak where many more people are subscribing to many more services, or, or if it's things such as the, the um, impact of the war in Ukraine really turning people off a lot of the, the things that they were using in their day to day uh, because of the, the news stories and, the, and the, the impact that that is having on their daily life, but certainly driving um, essentially a direction of, of potential churn there. So how do we combat that? But what's quite interesting about all of this um, is despite all of these things going on, um, one of the key drivers that's coming out in the data is around the quality and the experience is still very important to customers out there in the market. And, and a good example I use around this is, is something many people are familiar with, is kind of the, the pet food subscription model that's out there and pretty much a global um, existence nowadays. Really, that does quite well because um, its model is obviously subscription based. It's got that recurring revenue um, impact in terms of driving through um, consistent revenue. But actually, as a consumer, it's, it's impacting on an area that everybody holds dear. It's their pet. It's their loyalty to their pet. And it's their ownership of that pet that's important to them. But also with these food subscriptions for your pets, there's the element of personalization. It's not just an off the shelf pet food. It's quite often tailored to your particular type of breed or particular dog, medical circumstances, things as that. So really that's a good example of where the value, the quality, the, the fact that consumer sees that as an important subscription in their life, they will continue to spend money on that and actually spend you know, high amounts of money on those types of things. And that's where it's important for you, for you as publishers as well to, to, to make the most of that. How can you make sure that your content and the, the offering that you're giving to your uh, customer base it really is um, the quality and experience they're driving for? And what are the opportunities maybe in some of the other things that you do around events, around maybe um, puzzles, um, being able to support donations, things like that that you can offer to really help broaden the experience for that customer that makes them hold it dear to them. Above and beyond that, the important thing is the fact that this um, economic um, circuit and uncertainty is really driving people to, yes, cancel, but not everybody's canceling. A lot of people are looking at cost control and how do they manage those things. So it's important to look at that aspect and how you can work with that. So that can be, uh, for example, we'll talk throughout the, the rest of these slides, scenarios such as pause, being able to put a subscription on hold so that a customer can take a little delay and can come back later. How do you support mechanisms like that so you don't totally lose them and they're willing to come back because they've got that flexibility when they're ready? Um, always, always key to con consider that within, you, within your life cycle and your, um, within your channels. And then the last bit is the channels themselves. Lots of people are focusing on their, their own channels, their direct channels their website, their apps, um, any communication you've got going via email or whatever um, SMS messaging you might have going on, things like that. But also starting to look at some of the other indirect channels that are out there and making sure that you're utilizing the absolute maximum opportunities to bring a level playing field, whether that's a direct or an indirect channel. And we'll talk about some of those indirect channels um, a bit later on in our slides, whether that be um, something as such as a, an in-app store, an Apple store, or a Google Play store, or whether that be banking apps and such, which is what Erica will touch on quite heavily for you today. And of course, it's also important to consider the payment methods um, that are driving some of these because they all have different um, impacts on customers and their behaviors and what you can, you can do to optimize those things. And again, something we'll touch on shortly. 
Okay. Thanks, Paul. Hi, everyone. So what do we know about churn and changes in the subscription economy? Um, well, Min is fortunate that we are in quite a unique position. We're a two-sided infrastructure. So we've got subscription businesses on one side and we've got banks on the other. And we actually act as a facilitator in serving up subscription management within banking apps for consumers. And that gives us quite a unique perspective on data and insights, and it helps us guide our product development. But to complement that, we also launched um, a subscription economy report in Q4 of last year, and that was in partnership with FT Strategies and Savanta. And we surveyed subscription businesses, thought leaders, and consumers, including across the um, media industry. And overwhelmingly, we saw that 68% of businesses actually cited retention as their top strategic priority. And that is quite a big shift from the acquisition hamster wheel that's been going on in the subscription economy for the last few years. When then you look at the consumer side of things, 93% are actually reporting a greater awareness of how much they're spending on subscriptions. So it's very much top of mind. Um, and we can see the top reasons for canceling are that they're switching to a competitive product. There is a, a price hike, um, which has become a very dominant theme throughout 2022, uh, or there's a poor customer experience. But I think the good news about this is that these are all manageable, these are all fixable, and there's retention tools out there to help us improve and close and close that gap on um, churn. In addition to that, um, we can see that 37% have actually canceled a uh, service in the last six months and 42% are going to do so within the next six months. The subscript, this uh, cancellation frenzy isn't going to stop anytime soon, but I think we need to think about the outlook and what that really means, because it doesn't necessarily mean that all these consumers want to sever ties with their subscription. It doesn't mean true engagement. Um, actually, it's just a shift in consumer behavior and how consumers are interacting with their subscriptions and wanting to manage their subscriptions. It's almost like we've entered into a new era post pandemic and now we're in the cost of living crisis that we've moved into, you know, subscription management and subscription economy version 2.0. Paul. Thanks, Erica. So what we're going to do is talk to you through the different types of churn um, and also the impacts that we'll have on those direct and indirect channels um, and the considerations within those. I'm sure many of you are aware, but we wanted to kind of highlight this really to, to make sure that anybody that isn't the two types of main churn that you will see. Um, that is that voluntary churn. So really that customer making a conscious decision to, to cancel, whether that be an immediate cancel or whether that be something where they kind of cancel and retain whatever's left of their current <laughs> period um, and how you manage uh, those types. And then the involuntary churn, which is usually something to do with the underlying payment mechanism underneath, you know, whether that's being that the, you've got insufficient funds in, on your, your bank card, whether your card has expired or whether it's kind of some other uh, decline or, or failure reason that's causing that. How do you uh, manage those and how do you maximize um, the, the retention and renewal of your subscriptions on a regular basis. So when looking at involuntary churn, um, it's all about incremental um, opportunity here. So a lot of these features will be commonplace and understood by many of you today, um, but it's also about you know, when to apply them and when to layer them on top of them, each other to really get the maximum out of that process, um, utilizing tools, features, services, as well as knowledge and experience and, uh, and, and data analysis to really drive the best improvements. So looking at the individual pieces there, and account update is, is, is something that's specifically targeted at, at, at cards and the payment mechanism there with the various card types. It's about understanding when your card is expiring or it's been marked as lost and stolen. How do you can you get those latest card numbers updated automatically? So you're not relying upon the customer to update their own card information. You can actually um, use that information, update it yourself proactively. There's different mechanisms to do that. Certainly in the market, what we're seeing right now is a, is a drive to move from kind of classic ways of doing that to things such as scheme and network tokens, which work in a very similar way to when you, you add a card to uh, an Apple Pay device or a Google Pay device on your phone. Similar works where they kind of uh, um, a map a card to a digital number of that card, and it keeps those things updated in sync nicely. Payment retries um, is, again, a, a key component. Um, essentially, what you don't want to do is rely upon 
In fact, if your initial attempt to take payment fails, that, uh, that, that's all you do. You kind of want to look at mechanisms behind that to really develop a rule set um, that you can, you can try and take payment multiple times, depending on the payment method in use. And it's about balancing that, really. So with cost of acquisition so high, really, it's about balancing the cost of trying payment multiple times versus giving access to content for a period of time and really understanding what the maximum approach is there. So... You know, what is that window that you will give somebody um, and also how many times you try and take payment within that. And then it's also about thinking about how that payment um, is actually being declined and handling the response and the, 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 the next step, depending upon that. If you're getting an insufficient funds, that doesn't mean it's a permanent um, decline. The chances are that at some point that person will probably have funding in their account. Whereas if it's an expired card or a blocked card, for example, as we'll talk to about today, and those things are, are much more, less likely to, to, to be successful. So you have a different mechanism in the way you react to those. And, then, and a good example of where payment retries really does help is in today's world, there's always a potential um, possibility of a technical outage cyber attack or something like that. Many years ago, there was a large example that we had with Visa um, downstream. There, there, was a, there was a big outage and having that retry mechanism meant that you know, your subscriptions don't churn, you, you have the ability to retry and you cater for those downstream technical outages as well. And then grace periods, it's something that's often uh, overlapped with retry retries and people think it's the same thing, but uh, essentially there is a difference and there's the ability to control those separately. So really that's about looking at your profile of your customer and your product. For an annual plan, do you want to give somebody a little bit longer because the value is higher to, to kind of um, recover their, 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 their subscription each month? Um, looking at your grace period and tailing it to the type of payment method that it is as to whether that's different for cards versus PayPal or direct debit, for example. And then tailoring those two things together to create a combined approach. And then... The other key aspect is around the local needs of those things. So we talked about the differences with each different payment mechanism, payment method that is underneath. It is also the same when you consider um, different geographies and different regulations that might be in place. Good example would be payment processing. If you have a card, the customer may be in the UK or it may be in Europe or they may be in the US, but their, their card may have been issued from somewhere else. So how do you make sure that when you're processing that card payment, it's at, the, it's at the point that it will be uh, its optimal window for being accepted by the bank. Obviously, each bank will take a fraud risk on a transaction. So if it's at the wrong time for that bank and it's in the middle of the evening or you know, late hours, they'll risk that more fraudulently at a higher rate than they would do if it was during the day. So it's about maximizing those little things, making sure that you're utilizing um, local debit networks rather than just the international Visa or MasterCard schemes. And then around customer engagement, all about utilizing your self-care messaging, email communications, and also making sure that you are tailoring those messages depending upon the circumstance. We mentioned before insufficient funds. The messaging to your customer would be different in that scenario than it would be if their card had expired. You want them to take action to replace their expired card. Insufficient funds is slightly different. And then finally, around optimizing um, your processing. This is where this is a combination of knowledge, experience, and utilizing the right partners to do this sort of thing. Very simple things here. Making sure you're using your right merchant category code for your service, or if you've got card processing. Um, analyzing the declines that you're getting within the marketplace and making sure that you're not getting false declines, making sure transactions are flagged correctly and that you understand those decline reasons so you know how to react to them and what to do next, whether to engage with your customer or not. All very important to make sure that your renewals are optimized and your payment rates are as high as possible in terms of acceptance. And then if we look at... Um, Voluntary churn. So this is where your customer is really taking an action to decide what to do. It's about looking at the different tools and techniques to do that. One of the key ones is around exit surveys, understanding your customer's desire. This is useful in making decisions, but it's also useful in deciding what you do next. So for example, 
you may be able to make a decision as to whether to, to give somebody an offer. But also, if you don't have a, a, an ability to pause a subscription, by understanding why that customer is cancelled, and they may drive you to the, the information that you need to make that decision that that's something you want to introduce in the future. So it's really key to understand that. Excuse me one second. Um, and then it's also key from a publishing point of view, you've got lots of valuable content. We talked before about different verticals, whether you've got games, whether you've got um, puzzles, whether you've got events that you can also publicize as additional revenue streams. How do you utilize that stuff and offer it to your customers? So that actually you can, you can draw them into um, wanting to, to remain with your service. And again, go into that point earlier, see the value and, and hold it dear as a, as a subscription that's key to their life. Um, so that is, you know, you can do that with content and making recommendations. You can offer bundles of packages. Um, you can offer um, upgrades and downgrades to those types of services as well to really drive that behavior. And then other features and services that we can connect into that are, are related to the ability to pause, maybe being able to redirect your subscription. If you have a physical newspaper, maybe you want to actually redirect it so you can send it to the hotel that you're going to be on holiday for. Maybe you want to be able to donate it to a charity, a local charity, so you don't actually cancel your subscription for a period of time. You're just going to donate it and you feel you know, better about being able to do that as part of your subscription plan. And then entitlement flexibility is another key area. Um, being able to consider how you engage with your customer and keep them as an active subscriber is key even if they are not necessarily contributing to the revenue for that particular month. So being able to get them through a period where you might have a low, um, uh, low transaction day, or you may have low kind of publishing content, but you've got a big event coming up, or you expect a, a higher news traffic or higher content traffic in a couple of weeks, how can you get them to that point so that you retain them overall as a, as a customer and you keep your subscriber numbers high even though they are not necessarily uh, utilizing the payment at that type of, of period. And how do, you, how do you retain them overall? And then the last point here is about monitoring that churn risk. And that, and that is the key, really. It's about being proactive as well as reactive. How do you make sure that you understand your customer behavior? Are they actually browsing your content, reading your content? Are they looking at particular content, but not other types? They may be looking at your news, but not your sport or... They may be looking at your um, uh, e economic or financial pages, but not other uh, aspects. How can you use that to make decisions proactively within the, within the churn cycle? There we go. Great. So then if we look at voluntary churn through indirect channels, there's two key ones that come to the forefront, and that's the app stores and the banking apps. If we think about um, this cancellation frenzy that's been happening in mainstream news recently, but then we also think, actually, that's not surprising because there's been such huge exponential growth in the subscription economy as well. We've all been playing catch up over, you know, the, the last few months and years. There's been changes to, you know, regulatory directives to include subscriptions within there. There's been changes from subscription businesses in how they do their business models and price plans. So there's been huge change in the industry. If we then look at um, uh, the left, right hand side, um, you can see that currently we have over 11 subscriptions and that's going to increase to 17 by 2025. Um, and then you think per household now, that's 20 subscriptions. That's a huge administrative undertaking to be managing all of that, particularly given the different entry points that people are subscribing through and exiting through and that they have lots of different payment methods that they might subscribe to as well. It's, it's very fragmented, but that actually provides us with a huge opportunity to optimize and potentially also to consolidate. So what we see from the app stores, so we're talking here about the likes of Google Play and Apple App Store, is in the last one to two years, they have you know, risen to the surface in amplifying their subscription management capabilities in that they now have clearer cancel and resubscribe buttons. And they've also started to introduce pause and offers into that flow. But then you think about the subscription billing plat uh, platform providers like Aptitude, who've been working 
for a number of years with subscription businesses directly, definitely app stores are still behind the curve in terms of being able to uh, work with subscription businesses to drive end to end through that subscription life cycle and to be able to um, engage consumers and drive the next best action from them. Then we've got the bank app. Um, and now there's a lot of activity happening in the bank app in relation to subscriptions. One in five consumers are actually cancelling via a bank. Um, it does present a problem uh, in that uh, when the customers are actually calling to cancel a subscription in regulated markets like the UK and the US, when a cancellation request is made, a block is actually placed on that bank card instead. So it's not actually a true cancellation. And those blocks are actually 30, on average, about 13 months long, which is a very long time period when you think about how we use subscription management today, which is um, much more frequently. Um, so we have solved for this problem within MINA uh, with our um, unblock solution and our API. And we've been working in partnership with Aptitude to then um, deploy that and to be able to roll that out to relevant subscription businesses. And we see the industries that are most affected by this are the ones in media, in publishing and streaming and in gaming right now. Next slide. And then if we just think about the consumer behavior that we were talking about before, um, and we can really see like four core areas um, uh, rising to the surface in terms of changes. And that first one is around this kind of emergence of new subscription personas that, you know, people are acting and behaving differently with their subscriptions. And we call these the power users. And they're really demanding more from their subscription management. And the three that are really relevant for this, I think, are the remorseful, who are cancelling due to, due to price hikes. Uh, the uh, super switchers, who are hopping from subscription to subscription, but cancelling before they hop across. Um, and the savvy snackers who are just going into a service and realizing that they can binge consume, they can binge read, binge watch, binge stream uh, for a period of time and then they can cancel. The great news about this is from our um, uh, insights that we have working with banks and subscription businesses, we can actually see 25% of consumers want to return and 80% of that 25% want to do so in as little as three months, which is a very, very short time frame. But when you overlay that with a 13 month block, um, you can see that consumers can't organically return and also subscription businesses can't really very easily um, win back those consumers. Then we've got the cost of living crisis. Um, so this is really driving the need for personalization and the feeling of control for consumers. So consumers are actually using that monthly spend as a means of managing their outgoings. So, for example, we always see a minute surge of cancellations uh, during December because it's a very expensive month uh, traditionally. Um, but actually, uh, so people will cancel their subscriptions, but then by January, your bonus might have come in and uh, people are resubscribing again. Um, so it's really very much uh, being used as a tactic to manage outgoings. Then we've got this desire for omnichannel. So we're actually seeing consumers want omnichannel. Um, so they might subscribe through one channel, it might be through the merchant's app or website, but equally they might want to. Um, unsubscribe via a bank channel or through uh, some other means. And so it's having that flexibility and really looking at user experiences end to end and understanding all the doors and all the entry points to acquire a subscriber, retain them along that subscription life cycle and all the ways they might um, exit from that. So UX is really, really key in driving that forward. And then this notion of the super app and everybody's jockeying for position um, to become that super app. And actually the marketplaces are, and the app stores now are playing that role to an extent. Um, I do think bank channels also have a very strong position in playing the role of this super app. Not only can they manage subscriptions, but they're already doing many other things like financial services, but equally financial wellness, uh, money management and in future e-commerce so the ability to actually subscribe to new subscriptions as banks start to put marketplaces into their 
bank app. Um, and actually, we're really primed for this because post pandemic consumers are trusting their bank app uh, way more than they did um, in the past. But what we can see uh, from our um, survey is that between 72 and 86 percent of consumers would consider doing something other than cancel. So take up an offer, pause or change plan. And from these capabilities within uh, bank apps, we can actually see the impact that 6% would, would take up an offer or are taking up an offer rather than cancel. 10% are changing plan and 10% are pausing. So that's a huge uplift in terms of uh, moving the needle on um, improving retention and driving down churn. Um, so it's a huge opportunity um, for us to leverage. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. So yeah, as a quick as a quick summary, I guess um, really all of that. What do, what does it highlight to us really? And it's it's about that utilizing that best of breed um, life cycle and and um, partnerships to to really achieve those goals. Um, the key points are around you know having a look at what is going on with your customers, how they are behaving, and how they are wanting to interact with your service versus a competitor's service, understanding to try and uh, make a, a decision or a prediction before it happens. And then also being able to react to those things, um, whether that be, you know, essentially being able to react to what you've learned or being able to react to something that happens within the funnel in terms of an offboarding flow and having the tools and techniques in place that really can optimize that, those those actions and decisions that you make, whether that's communicating with your customer, whether that's making an offer to the customer or presenting some sort of different upgrade or bundle offer. From an involuntary churn, it's about using those tools and techniques. And this is where the, the knowledge and experience of what is involved downstream is very important. Payments is a very complicated area. Um, when it comes to subscription and recurring payments, it gets even more complicated. And it's about having that support and, and knowledge from, from your partners and your best of breed solutions that really will help you maximize those results over time. Certainly that's why uh, from an aptitude and a minor technology perspective, we recognize that we, we coexist as a partnership really well. We offer strengths individually. We offer strengths together to really um, leverage up what we want to do within subscription space and support customers and support our clients in, in, in reducing those churn um, and maximizing um, regular incomes for our customers. So really the, the optimization, um, both of a, a payment acceptance and a retention and a reducing that churn is really the key goal of what we're trying to do as a strategy together. Thank you. Paul, Erica, thank you so much. That was really, really good, really interesting. Um, you've got such a story to share there, I believe, which is so relevant to you know a lot of our audience today and, and as far as Inmar members are concerned. So before we get into some specific questions, let me just ask you a couple of questions about your companies, ever May. So um, you know, from what you've said, this sounds like there's some really good innovation going on between the two companies. And I'm interested to, to know, as I say, I think that can aid the publishers on on this call today in, in what are certainly on, on, in certain times. So maybe you could just explain how Mina and Aptitude are actively integrated maybe and what are your plans for moving forward with the partnership? Yeah, sure. Um, so at Mina, we've been solving for a very specific pain point and it's the, um, within the subscription life cycle, uh, which is around blocked bank card payments. Um, as a result of a cancellation being made via a bank, um, where we see Aptitude playing a, a, a really great role, where there's really great reciprocal value exchanges, where we see that friction and where we see the majority of cancellations and therefore blocked bank cards happening are across streaming, publishing and media businesses. Mm. Um, I think because of the nature of those businesses, they're highly competitive. You know, we've spoken a little bit, touched a little bit on the personas and the consumer behavior of these specific consumers within these industries that are, you know, snacking and switching and, and having mm -hmm. knee jerk reactions to price hikes. There's a lot of activity going on. And what we loved about Aptitude um, is that their client portfolio exactly mirrors uh, where we see that friction. So it gives us the ability to be able to um, 
reach out to, to those clients and actually scale that pace. Yeah, great. And um, and it seems, um, Erica, that, that Min is following a, a certain growth path, if you like, introducing that the innovation you talked about there through the UK to Europe to North America. And can you expand on the journey? There's lots of, well, I say 60 countries on the call today. What's your plans in terms of unlocking those sort of capabilities in other territories? Yeah, where we're seeing the most friction um, on from the bank side of our kind of in, ecosystem um, has been where where there are um, where the markets are regulated. So that's predominantly UK, US, and Australia. We've been really doubled down, doubling down on uh, UK and US to drive scale, so these solutions can reach you know tens and tens of millions. Um, so that's where we have really been focusing, but we've also uh, got presence across all of Europe as well, where we've been really focusing on not just the block bank card payments, but also retention solutions and those features that we spoke about as a whole. Um, so I would say across Europe, UK and US, uh, that's where we're seeing the most friction. And then in terms of regulated markets, the next one potentially would be Australia because they will be experiencing the same types of problems that we are. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. And, and, and just from an aptitude perspective, um, the acquisition of MPP Global, which we all remember, and that was what, about 18 months ago now, um, was obviously an exciting period for you. And I'm just wondering, what does that mean? And how does that differentiate you, you know, particularly, uh, I guess, in the realms of churn management? Yeah, certainly. So I think... Um you know, M MPP Global as it was in terms of the eSuite product, you know, it's been at the forefront of subscriber management, payment orchestration and optimization for a for wow. number of years. And, and we've always kind of looked at our ability to transform business models for customers and publishers specifically and reducing that total cost of ownership. So that is, that is something that we continue to do today and we will continue to, to focus on from a strategic point of view. What the aptitude acquisition has really brought to us is that additional layer really of, you know, they've got a, a very similar ethos, you know, as, a, as an organization. It was almost um, kind of a clash of the same in, in terms of really trying to solve complex problems for our clients and, and how do we deliver outstanding services and solutions by solving those pop, those um, uh, uh, complex problems, really. Um, but what this means technically is a lot of the aptitude core products are around financial um, uh, reconciliation and revenue reporting. And what we are now able to do is, is have those two subscription management and payment um, products and really combined with the revenue recognition. So what that means is from a finance function, as subscriptions have been a new revenue generation model and they are getting ever more complicated and complex, really automating and simplifying that finance function as much as possible by utilizing the aptitude um, tools and products really adds to that. And it's kind of a nice symbiotic relationship really in terms of product offering. Gotcha, thank you. Well, thanks for that. Well, let's dig into some uh, a deeper dive in some of the, the content now, if I may. So just to remind everyone, if you have a question for any of our panelists, if you have it, a, a chat button, ignore that, please. Just put your questions into Q&A and I'll pick them up from there and try and get them to our speakers. Um, so the first question I've got for you really is, is around the subject churn evaluation and benchmarks. And I'm wondering, how do you recommend publishers? You know, a lot of people on today are published. How do you, how do you reckon that they should be measuring churn? So what are the, some of the industry benchmarks and averages to aspire to maybe? Sure, I can tell that one. So um, generally, most publishers are, uh, are kind of managing churn from a month by month basis, right? Um, yeah. And they're kind of looking at that total number of subscribers and, and trying to work out a percentage rate that is churning per month. But that's one metric. It's also very important to look at the annual metric overall, yeah. because there's also always the element of seasonality or, you know, kind of annual trends that you see around Christmas, for example, that can sway that. Right. Uh, but generally speaking, a, a lot of it, depends upon kind of the the area you're in from a publishing perspective who, who your kind of um, your content and industry is who your customer base is the payment methods that you're using and the demographics that you're inter interacting with can have quite a big effect um, and really the important thing is, is is rather than a like for like comparison it is more about that incremental improvement of your own where you are and how you improve that going forwards Good example of that, you know, I've seen churn rates that can be as high as 30% from an, from an annual perspective. 
but really you want to get that up until single di single digits, certainly under 5% in, in terms of churn if you can. Yeah. Uh, but again, very dependent upon your kind of customer base and what's going on there. And we've got some really good uh, examples actually on, on our Aptitude website, give some really good um, case studies of, of examples where that's been successful. And just, just while I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Paul, um... I'm just wondering in terms of compliance, because we're in an era now, especially in, in, in media, like everywhere, but you've been very sensitive in terms of media companies. Is this whole thing about trust and compliance and transparency? And, you know, I'm just wondering, how do you ensure that, you know, your publisher churn strategies are absolutely compliant with industry regulations and standards and what, go, what goes with that? Yeah, and that's that can be complex, and it's it, it's always um, evolving as well. Um, you have, um, for example, in the card schemes that are out there, Visa, Mastercards of the world, introduced quite some time ago regulations around this idea of um, card on file, credential on file mechanisms to to really support how cards are stored and reused for recurring payments. And it was kind of an evolution of continuous authority that was there before. Mm. Um, that mm. was a almost a global global mandate, but it wasn't really heavily used. In Europe, that came into a big effect because of the SCA challenge and change in, in regulation there. And right. Those two things combined changed your behaviors as to what you had to do. Um, technically, from a payment perspective, a lot of it is, again, that knowledge and understanding how you're handling your transactions, that you're processing correctly, mm. and you're and you uh, making sure that you're optimizing your success rates. What's changing as well in the market is probably more of the kind of legal um, kind of countrywide and geographic wide regulations and, and things that are coming in. There's a lot around fairness of, of um, subscriber customer behavior. So ability to be able to cancel and making that as simple as possible, being able to keep people informed when a trial is ending, things like that. A lot of that is coming into the mix. Um, if you look at example in the UK and its own, you know, the government probably around about two years ago looked at a regulation around making sure that consumers can cancel, making sure that you get notified when a trial is about to happen. That's not actually kind of come in un and delivered itself into law, but it will be things that like that, that that drive through into the future. And certainly in some regions, it does, it does, it does happen. And it's, it's a parallel, I guess, to, to what we've just talked about to compliance of it. We had our first in our in-person conference in Stockholm in quarter four last year, uh, our first in-person conference since COVID. So it was a big thing for us to go back into an in-person conference. And one of the things we were talking about, in fact, I gave a presentation myself on uh, using subscription data uh, with our advertising side of the business and linking the two and using the insights we get from that to give back to our advertisers as our USP, if you like. And I'm just wondering, I'd, I'd be interested in your view and how, can, how do you think publishers can use data and analytics to inform retention efforts? Yeah, certainly. I think I think we, we touched on them briefly before, really. I mean, it's it's about understanding your customer's behavior. It's almost predicting yep. that information. What type of content are they looking at? Are they looking at that, that content? Are they, you know, uh, authenticating and logging into your platform on a regular basis? Or are they more kind of sporadic uh, looking at their payment behaviors in the past? Are they regular? Are they regular kind of payment failures because they they have a, a low amount of funding in their account or is it kind of an abnormality and you can tailor your reactions to that differently again whether that's email messaging whether that's actually proactively giving them an offer in, in the funnel to try and retain them um, but also it's about maximizing that in all of your channels so it, historically eSuite is a platform for example of, has offered all of those abilities to pause and make offers uh, dynamically for for many number of years the in-app stores have started to provide those things kind of more proactively over time now. So it's making sure that you're leveraging the same techniques you're using in your self-care yeah. portal to yeah. do the same sort of thing. Yeah. And one final question, I'm going to take some from the floor then from people um, about cost op optimization, if I may. And, and I think it's a really important subject. And um, how do you think publishers can optimize cost of renewals and minimize the chance of involuntary churn. churn. You were talking about this before through this lack of payment optimization or routing or local acquiring. I remember going back a while um, when uh, you guys were known as MP, MP Global, you did some research for Inmar and it was looking at payment failures and, and the cost news media, thousands of subscribers every year and publishers the report was saying it could try harder to save them as an, you know, an analysis of the six months of payment data was, was revealed. And basically they were saying up to a third of subscribers in the media churn every year due to payment failures, not because they wanted to leave, but because they had this involuntary phenomenon. Mm -hmm. 
or passive churn. And the reason for the payment failures were ranging from all sorts of forgetting to update their card details or lost and stolen bank cards or bank rejections, et cetera. And I think the view was is that, you know, publishers were not you using retry tooling aggressive enough. Would you subscribe to all of that? Still. Yeah, definitely. I th I, again, we go back to the it's it's, it's a multi layered approach of all of these techniques and tools really to to, mm. to optimize what you've got. You know, in terms of um, looking at what you're um, analyzing in terms of your decline codes and making decisions around what to do. Um, you know, when when it's an insufficient funds, quite happily to retry those ones because the the likelihood is that they will be successful. Um, but the ones that are blocked, we talked to, with, with Erica before about what. Um, a block being put on a card for 13 months potentially yeah, yeah. you know making sure that you're not retrying them because it's just costing you transaction fees to to do that making sure that you are spreading out your payments across the uh, across the time and, and many people have access to kind of um, a standard set of retries where you're trying multiple number of times uh, but being able to dynamically do that so you can change that depending upon your service change that depending on your payment method looking at the response code to decide what to do all of that dynamicism really helps you optimize that so your cost is as minimal as possible you've got your highest chance of success rate in terms of the transactions but also you're broadening that window to really retain somebody because to acquire them again costs a lot of money so you want to try and avoid that as best as possible great stuff thank you so let, let's just uh, guess jump on the plane let's go first over to san antonio in texas um, we've got Sok Kang who's asking, I think he just wants some amplification on something you might have mentioned earlier, which is what does actually micro payment revenue entail? Um, so this is really <laughs> multiple different things, really. These um, looking at different revenue streams and looking at how you can um, maximize your revenue stream in, in specific use cases. So, for example, we talked before about bundling. Right. Yeah. So we, we talk about being able to have a subscriber um, and being able to kind of maximize other opportunities um, that really keep them as a subscriber. So you could have puzzles, you could have games and things like that. Um, but also looking at opportunities where you're combining kind of a subscription model uh, with something that's kind of more of a um, almost like a pay as you go model or a usage based model. You can combine all of those things mm -hmm. together. Um, that really opens up with certainly in the publishing space with the change in advertising revenue and advertising models um, leveraging these things showing the value to the consumer but actually being able to support them and again we talked about aptitude and their revenue recognition mo models um, that complexity can be handled within that kind of an, uh, a kind of a process end to end so that you can support different business models side by side and really offer what your customer wants and desires so that they're not going to leave I've got a question if we're going to come back to the UK. I've got a question of Sam Shedden, who's asking a great question. Um, and Sam is from, if I've got my uh, figures right, from the National World Publishing Limited in the UK here. He's asking, I was wondering if there's any data on how many people reactivate a subscription after pausing. Yeah, I mean, what we see from our data is this is not specific to react you know the reactivating after after pause has taken off but what we do see is that if a consumer is saved um at um point of cancellation and moves on to do either change plan pause or takes up an offer quite easily the lifetime value of that consumer can be extended by an additional 50 percent so by using these retention capabilities you're instantly potentially doubling the lifetime value of that consumer. And as we move away from acquisition and we look at like what value um, is being driven and looking at the value of that consumer, um, that becomes really, really important. Right, thank you. Um, over we go to the States and to the Post and Courier, Mary Fox is saying, I knew someone would pick this subject, of an involuntary churn, what percentage of our overall churn should we aim to be involuntary? Do, should we have a goal for that? So generally speaking, um, and this is, uh, I would say, one of the, uh, the metrics to always uh, consider and, and why I highlight the fact that it's always about kind of your, uh, your own like for like incremental uh, com comparisons rather than trying to compare it to a, somebody else's benchmark. Um, generally speaking, involuntary churn tends to be around about a third um, compared to two thirds for the, for the voluntary. Um, but what you obviously you can see is you tend to, if you focus on your 
um, voluntary churn um, kind of flow and, and making sure that you've got really good tools and techniques and mechanisms in place there, hopefully you'll drive that down, which will have the seesaw effect of bringing your involuntary percentage up. So it's always that comparison of knowing what you're doing and understanding where that change is going to expect to have an impact and, modify, and, and monitoring to check that, that that is having the impact you expect. And staying in the States, a question that came across my mind too from Kelly, uh, Kelly Dukake from uh, Hearst Corporation in the US, who's asking, how often would you recommend retrying credit cards that have failed? So with credit cards specifically, there's been um, some regulation brought in by the schemes that kind of control that um, in terms of how many times you're allowed to um, attempt, depending on the actual decline reason. Um, so it depends upon factors like that. Um, generally speaking, again, it's tailored towards kind of the, the cost element of it. The more transactions that you try, the more it's going to cost you versus the value of the content that you're selling. Um, and obviously the whole acquisition cost if, if you were to lose somebody. Um, so there's not, there's not a hard and fast answer for that. But generally speaking, the, the, the key is to try and keep the period of time that you're, that you're um, attempting to retry a payment for as, as long as possible. Um, but, uh, but your number of attempts to minimize that and spread those out nicely across that period of time so that you can, uh, you can understand the best results. Right. And, and Graham McDougall is asking, how are super switches and savvy snackers being identified during Dunnings? You know, are, they, are they being identified before or after? Um, what are other profiles are there? And how should we be approaching them differently? Do you like to say that one, Erica? Or? You can take it, Paul. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, it's, it, it depends upon the tools and techniques available and what you're using today. Um, what I would say with um, super switchers, uh, to some degree, they can be seen as a, as a negative thing, right? They, they are hopping around different content. But actually, one of the positives um, around a super switcher is that they're more likely to come back uh, at some point if you've got the valuable content. Uh, and sometimes it's their dynamic to kind of go, go and try different things rather than it's being something that they're unhappy with your service. Um, so it's about um, maximizing your uh, kind of techniques to engage with those people. So again, I go back to the points where we talked before about the difference between um, somebody that might want to control their costs versus somebody that might want to cancel um, and how you can kind of keep somebody as a subscriber. So, so you know, uh, hopefully the maximum is if, you've, if you're getting a, a payment decline, for example, for a reason that is actually to do with the funding, um, then actually then you probably want to, um, you know, manage how you're trying that depending upon the decline reason but if somebody's kind of wanting to switch um, and they're making that voluntary choice then you can de depend on what you offer them or, or how you try and retain them um, you can look at their past behavior and make that decision within the flow whether to give them something such as an, an entitlement to get them over a period of time so you might find for example that they're a bit of a seasonal um, content um, user in that the, they they always follow your sport content or your political content if you can get them to a period where that content is going to be lower and you expect it to pick up you can kind of give them the entitlement to get them to to that point and retain them as a subscriber because that's where your lifetime value is going to come after that point um, so it's looking at mechanisms like that great stuff that was graham asking that question from dc thompson here in the uk thank you graham we're going to go and back again though with the us uh, for the Atlanta Journal Constitution, and Mark Sasser is asking, how are you overcoming all these new apps and services that locate and manage and stop subscriptions? I was going to say, Paul, I don't think they they need to be overcome. Um, I think it's great um, that there's an emergence of consumer subscription management apps as well. Um, at Mino, we're all about um, creating a problem-free subscription economy. So the more businesses that are behind solving this, we can all innovate and um, evolve the subscription economy together. I think the, the challenge potentially with those apps is how you can scale them and how they become agnostic and how um, you can reach millions of consumers. So with the work that we're doing as a white label subscription um, business, we are able to scale to many countries, uh, many banks and reach millions of consumers with a consistent and agnostic approach. Uh, and 
I think the benefit for subscription businesses is the data and insights that we can glean from that. We can constantly innovate together and we can constantly improve the, um, the subscription life cycle and the journey and the user experience in ways that you can't maybe necessarily do as a, as a B2C um, app. I'm going to take another couple of questions before we round this off. Uh, we're running out of time. We could talk for all night on this subject, couldn't we? It's such a great thing. So um, back in the States again, we've got another question. Uh, and, and Mary Fox is saying, we have a 28-day grace period for all subscribers. Would you recommend a certain grace period for monthly and annual if we target those separately? Um, generally speaking, yes. Um, it depends upon the, the product product proposition within those um but yeah targeting um essentially your annual plan you know there's a lot more revenue there if you can retain that customer um mm -hmm. depending upon your decline reasons as to why that's taking over a month for them to, to to be successful uh would be would be the real driver to whether you extend it beyond a month um but certainly it, it's it's a it's a, a potential thing to look into to consider that for the annual plans uh, and tailoring it for them specifically to give them more chance to pay and the final question I've got for you today is all about personalization, which is something which is coming to the fore in the media industry uh, very much so at the moment. And you mentioned at the start of the presentation of personalization. I'm wondering, again, your view about how can publishers create a, a personalized experience to keep subscribers engaged and prevent the churn we've all been talking about? I think a big part of this is sort of the artificial intelligence and the data and insights and how that is leveraged to best drive the next best action for the consumer um, so that you can keep them engaged. Um, so I would definitely lean into um, the, the intelligent side of things mm -hmm. and um, be, being able to uh, understand the consumer and serve up what they need at that time uh, to <clears throat> potentially be able to retain them, but also if they generally want to, you know, to churn, also providing them the easy ability to, to do that as well. Good stuff. Well, guys, thank you so much for your expertise, your insights, your knowledge today. It's been invaluable. So I really, really appreciate for what you've done here. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us, a record crowd. Um, a reminder that the uh, link to the presentation and the slides that you saw will be sent to you over the next 24 hours. Uh, meanwhile, go to inma.org slash webinars to see what's coming up. I can tell you what's coming up next week. Uh, we have a, a webinar called Creating a New Product Within a Legacy Brand. And we'll have the Financial Times of London and we'll have Afton Post and Part of Shipstead in Norway uh, with us, hosted by my good friend Jody Hopperton, who's a product lead here at Inmar. So, you know, launching a new product within a legacy news media organization isn't always easy, but it can be necessary to acquire new readers. So the folks who mentioned that I mentioned there will look at the challenges such as customer acquisition, brand reputation, the potential cannibalization of existing products. And they'll also discuss customer research from understanding macro trends to in-depth one-to-one interviews. So you can register now at imba.org slash webinars. Meanwhile, thanks again for joining us. Thanks to Aptitude, to Minna. Um, we'll see you all again soon. If you have any questions for our speakers on the slides, you'll see Paul's email address. And if you have any questions, you can pop them over to him later. Thanks for everyone. We'll catch you all again soon. Bye for now.